Hello, everyone. Uh, let's get uh, seated. We're just about to, or just on time to get started. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today we have uh, another very nice talk with some of our uh, invitees from uh, Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua and from UACJ. Uh, thank you so much for coming here today. And today the panel is about binational water research, binational water research. Uh, so to moderate the panel, uh, we have the Dean of the College of Engineering, uh, Professor Ken Meisner, who began his role as the Dean of the University of Texas at El Paso in the College of Engineering in August 3, 2022. Uh, Meisner arrived at UTEP with a robust history of service in both the private sector and academia, having most recently served as founding Pro Vice Chancellor Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Swansea University in Wales. So thank you so much for coming, Dean and the microphone was all yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was the longest title I've ever had in my life when I was at Swansea. I mean, it took up an entire business card. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to thank everybody for coming both uh, both here and online. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this panel. And uh, I think we have some uh, some great experts here. And uh, um, Hopefully it's it's as rewarding and we can get some audience participation on questions and such um, to to uh, lead off with some opening remarks I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Mauricio Ibarra Ponce de Leon, who is the Consul General uh, for Mexico in El Paso. Dean, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, let me just start, as always, when I visit UTEP, thanking UTEP for the collaboration that we have. Um, thanking uh, President Heather Wilson, because she, she has been key in strengthening relation, the relationship with Mexican universities, both in Chihuahua and Ciudad Juarez. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson. I have to recognize Dean Meisner for, for his presence and everything he's doing. And today we have a, a great panel of experts uh, who, who are going to be talking about binational research, important binational issues. So, Ingeniero Marco, eh, Mario Vázquez, welcome. Eh, Doctor, eh, Doctora Beatriz Rocha, thank you. And Juan Carrillo, thank you, Doctor, for coming. Um, just to say that I always talk about the importance of water issues, especially for the binational relation is one of the key um, items in, in our bilateral discussions between federal governments and obviously should be a key element for the discussion here um, at the border for a uh, for obvious reasons um, i wanted to say that we have for these discussions especially in this binational panel i want to talk about the key institutional framework that both countries have to deal with water issues. So this is uh, uh, something that it's in the framework of, uh, of a bilateral treaty from 1944. And we have the institutional framework specifically uh, organized to talk about this issue. So on the Mexican side, we have SILA, Mexico, which is, a, a, is ex the counterpart of the International Boundary and Water Commission, the IBWC. So we have the talent here in the region to talk about issues uh, that are important. We need to talk about the scarcity of water. We need to talk about how to reduce water, how to save water. We need to make this issue um, in the top of our discussions, specifically for, for what we're talking. No? Uh, we were talking just before we started with, uh, with Dean Meisner, and I think it's very important to start highlighting this issue, but we need to prepare the people who are going to be dealing with water issues as we move along. 
we are talking about right now how to take advantage, for example, of the near shoring and the ally shoring and the friendly shoring. And every company that wants to come here needs water. So we need to be talking about that. How is going to affect us? Can we supply or not? What, are, what is going to happen with the water in our homes? No? So for that, I think we need to take advantage of the talent that we have here, as I mentioned, the institutional talent that we have here, the talent and expertise of leaders in the academia, such as our panel experts, uh, about uh, having UTEP, having WATCH, having UACJ, another COLEF, different college institution. So we have to take advantage of the proximity, of the talent, of having IBWC and SILA Mexico, and to talk about how to collaborate in research, the challenge that we're going to face uh, moving along, like uh, scarcity of water, conservation of water, and we need to understand the issue. So I hope that this panel does that with you. I hope that you learn a lot and, and that you keep always in mind that we need to be aware of this limit resource that is water and we need to keep it and we need to take advantage and look ahead of what's going to happen with it. So thank you, Dean uh, Meisner. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I couldn't agree more with all the words uh, that you were saying and the importance of water. And uh, um, you were supposed to have a couple other um, uh, opening remarks, people from far more important than I, but uh, you're stuck with me. Um, so I, I'll make a few more uh, uh, remarks, let you know my relationship with water a little bit uh, before going on to the uh, to introduce our panelists and get this rolling. So I did move to the desert, to El Paso from Wales. And I don't know if you know anything about Wales, but there's a lot of water in Wales. Um, and uh, that introduced its own set of problems, actually. And um, I'm so glad to see that we're linking this up with the UN's um, uh, water initiatives, um, the water, using water for peace. And I think I've been a, always been a big fan of uh, the UN's 17 goals for sustainable development. And I think that uh, linking in with that really expands the field and the playing field and what we're able to do so when I was at Swansea, for instance, we had a, a, a program using citizen scientists where people, when they were out talk, work, taking a hike or a walk, um, could take pictures of rivers and streams, and they would be uploaded and GPS located. And this occurred all the way across Europe, and we, we, we were the center of it. But it looked at the, bank, the banks of the river and how that was impacting the water flow and, and such. And I think... If we can get into this wider discussion around water, about uh, how it is multinational, it flows everywhere, um, it's, it's incredibly important. Now, I'm, I'm a biomedical engineer and a, a laser physicist, so I'm a bit of a geek. Um, and, no, I am a geek. I might be the definition of a geek, as a matter of fact. But I did uh, do some very early water work um, when I was out in industry. Um, we were working on non-invasive glucose diagnostics, but at the same time, we had a project where we were trying to bioremediate ethylene glycol and propylene glycol. Uh, we lived in Wisconsin, so from the airport, there was an awful lot of ethylene propylene glycol from all the de-icing de that would occur on the planes. And so we were working for a, to, to bioremediate that. And I think that was a great opportunity and look, for me at least, on how to use um, water and reuse water to take care of, uh, take advantage of that. In Wisconsin, not quite as scarce a resource, but still always a scarce resource. So with that, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the organizers asking me to do this because we did have an international sand pit here last year, and one of our panelists was actually at the, at the sand pit. And um, it was getting the researchers from UTEP and WATCH together to talk about these sort of binational uh, water issues. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing from our, from our panelists. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do the introduction, and then... Uh, We'll get to the meat of the uh, of the um, process here. So, okay, all right. I can operate it. No. For those of you of a certain age, I will go beep, and uh, and we'll advance the film strip. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, our first uh, uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Beatrice uh, Roca who's uh, been a professor of chemistry at the University of Chihuahua since 2013. She obtained a master's degree in sciences with a major in analytical chemistry and a PhD 
in environmental sciences and engineering from UTEP. Welcome back. <laughs> um, uh, her work uh, has concentrated on drinking water quality, focused on fluorine and nitrate concentrations, the reuse of wastewater in ag agriculture, and reclaimed water in industry. Also, her research includes detection and quantification focused on two groups of emerging pollutants, organochlorine pesticides and PBDEs in wastewater. Dr. Roja has pre presented her research findings in several international, national, and regional scientific meetings. She has publications in international journals listed in Scopus in all areas of her research and is part of the Mexican Researchers Institute. Dr. Roja has been a PI in Mexican federal grants and regional funds in research projects related to water treatment. Our, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Juan Carlos. Um, he's a chemical engineer uh, hailing from Veracruz University and holding a master's degree in hydraulic resources, along with a doctorate in environmental science and technology. Current, currently serving as a full-time professor at Botch, he specializes in hydrogeochemical modeling, um, <laughs> uh, as well, oh, I'm gonna catch up, uh, modeling and the development of affordable filters for arsenic and fluoride removal. Juan Carlos boasts a rich academic background with notable contributions, including nine indexed scientific articles and an active participation in a conocet funded research project focusing on groundwater contaminants in the Sierra Madre Occidental in Mexico. His dedication extends as a scientific reviewer for Environmental Engineering and Management Journal, lending his expertise to ensure the quality and rigor of published research in the field. And finally, last but not least, <laughs> Uh, uh, Mario Vasquez is a uh, chemical and environmental engineer with over four decades of expertise spanning various aspects of water and wastewater treatment, environmental impact assessment, and industrial safety. With a robust background in fields such as environmental risk uh, assessment, occupational health, and renewable energy feasibility. Previously serving as director of technical assistance at the North American Development Bank until 2021, Mario oversaw diverse programs evaluating air quality projects, urban solid waste management, and renewable energy initiatives. He also played a pivotal, pivotal role in green infrastructure development, regional planning, and environmental project management. In addition to his professional roles, Mario is actively involved in academia as a part-time lecturer uh, at Wasahota and uh, sharing his knowledge and expertise with the next generation of environmental professionals. He also collaborates with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and uh, contributing to the global efforts towards sustainable and, envir and environmental stewardship. So welcome all. I think at this point, um, each of you have a, uh, a presentation to give, and then afterwards we'll have uh, the panel discussion and hopefully many, many questions. So everybody pay attention both in the room and online. Thank you, everyone, for being here in this uh, water panel. Thank you, Yute, for hosting us. And I would like to thank to the watch for all the support executing these projects. And today I'm going to uh, talk about one of the projects that we are currently running in the University of Chihuahua. And the title is a study of the levels and distribution of a very common herbicide called glyphosate in an agricultural area of Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, this is my collaborate, collaboration team uh, from UTEP. Uh, I have the pleasure to have Dr. Wen Yi Li. She is the PI of this project. And Dr. Hugo Gutierrez from the Environmental Science uh, Department. And in WASH, I have the great support of our grant analysis of Dr. Lourdes Ballina and Dr. David Chavez. Well, uh, I would like to start uh, with, the, with the topic, and I'll, I have to mention that this project was uh, awarded with, with the, with the 20,000, with uh, man, an amount of $20,000, and it's the U.S.-Mexico Facility Collaboration Fellowship uh, 2023 and 2024. And this uh, research, or in this study, what we proposed was to study the levels and distribution of the herbicide. Maybe you are familiar with this uh, uh, agricultural product, and maybe you have it at home, the Roundup. It's very common to eliminate uh, weeds 
And the problem is that this herbicide is prohibited in, in many countries like the Netherlands, France, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and in Salvador, but it's still used in the United States. And the problem is that you can get it, let's say that all, almost from the grocery stores. So it's not, you don't need a special permit to use it. It's very effective, it's very cheap, but the problems with this uh, chemical is that can cause neurological, respiratory, kidney uh, diseases, and also birth defects, different form of cancer, spontaneous abortions, infertility, skin diseases, nervous, nervous system damage, and Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, just to mention some of the negative uh, effects. So uh, we say, okay, let's see what are the levels, because not many studies have been reported um, the presence of this chemical because the methodology and the levels at which can be are very low. But the problem is that there is, uh, this herbicide is bioaccumulate and biomagnificant. We choose the Bustillos Lagoon. The Bustillos Lagoon is a very important water body in, in Chihuahua, Mexico. It is considered as a priority wetland by the U.S. Fish and Wild Services. And also it has been evaluated as one of the most treated ecosystems because of the anthropogenic activities. The main discharges of the lagoon are the runoff uh, from the intensive agricultural use and industrial and domestic water discharges. The bad thing is that this water is used for irrigation of certain uh, crops and also for other agricultural purposes. So the Bustillo Lagoon is a very large area. Its area is around uh, 3,300 uh, 3, 3, square kilometers. So we divide the sign in several uh, areas. And we plan to make three sampling events. So far, we have collected 150 samples from the lagoon and other areas like the Mennonite fields, uh, 50 samples of soils, 15 samples of corn and 15 samples of roots. And these are some pictures of our first sample. Sampling, I'm sorry. And in that picture, we have some uh, collaborators like the students in the ESC program here at UTEP, Jesus Ochoa, uh, Dr. Luli Vallinas, and myself. And here we can see the students taking uh, on site. Um, parameters like conductivity, turbidity, et cetera. And one of the, the other students taking the, the water samples. And here in the lagoon, uh, we collect uh, like 100 samples until October last year. And here we have other students uh, working in the lab. So in the first sampling, we collect this, the water samples and the, the crops and the soils were planned for the second sampling. The second sampling started in October because in October is when the harvest uh, start being collected. And we went there. Here we have Dr. Wengi Lee from the chemistry department, the PI of this project, and Dr. Hugo Gutierrez. Uh, they went there to the Bustillos Lagoon to meet the, the area. And we collect the, the corn samples and storage them at the watch laboratories. And here we also took some samples from some special areas called Tajos, which are uh, water bodies that the Mennonite use as reservoirs for water for the irrigation. And also we have uh, Dr. Wengi Lee giving a seminar in the, in the watch during the chemistry week. She was uh, presenting and teaching us different uh, green methodologies for extraction of these chemicals as the organic pollutants, in this case, herbicides. In, and she was in the university exchanging um, ideas with the students and also uh, she went to the sample with us. So uh, the students in this project uh, are, I think, and that's what I say, they are enjoying going to field. And we would like to thank UTEP for the found and also to watch for uh, supporting us executing all these activities because maybe uh, saying something in the Bustillos Lagoon can sound some, um, something easy, 
but it was very hard because we had some technical troubles, as you can see here. We appear in the newspaper because we got stuck in the Bustillos Lagoon. So um, it's part of the of the research of field, right? So <coughs> I'm sorry. I want to uh, acknowledge to my students, two of them are here and they are gonna present tomorrow the posters, part of the results of, of this research. And Aniel, Natalia, uh, America, Eric, and Carlos, and also to the staff helping us. And of course, again, to UTEP and WASH. So this is one of the project. The other project that we are barely starting is the sand pit. It's related with the wetlands. But uh, I wanted to present this one because we have more results than in the other one. So right now we are running two projects. So we have the, the benefit to have found to continue doing research in the border region. Thank you. Any question or question will be at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. It's really interesting. Very interesting. I, 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 I've gotten stuck like that, um, uh, but out in the bay in Swansea, which isn't good because the tide comes in. <laughs> So it's kind of time limited. <laughs> All right, for our next presentation, uh, Juan Carlos, I think you're up. Uh, let's see. There it is. Yes. <laughs> you good? Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is um, Tim. We're talking about integrate prototype for recovering jet water from reverse osmosis plants using greenhouses for solar power high recovery evaporation. Okay, um, and, um, this is was uh, the first sand pit you you tap you uh, watch in twenty uh, twenty three. Um, the results of this first sand pit was the this project uh, where we uh, collaborate Graciela, Rosario, um, Berta, um, Alex, Meyer, Juan Manuel, uh, Martin, Leobardo, Carmen, Julia, David, and me. Uh, this is the team project. So, um, excuse me. Um, Um, as you know, um, we need a sustainable water and to produce um, sustainable cities. You know that um, the, the water that comes from, from, from the soil, it's, that it is groundwater, um, has a lot of minerals, a lot of uh, solids, and it's not possible. So um, we need to um, to to trade the water uh, using uh, our old systems, um, we have a drinking water, but we also have uh, waste streams, high concentration in salts. Uh, so, uh, one of the, the situations is that um, this uh, water can be um, sent to the uh, groundwater again, but um, the integrate prototype has this uh, challenge. Retain flow re rejected from a reverse osmosis plant and um, using uh, brackish um, water and uh, come back to the aquifer. The objective is use uh, reverse osmosis water as a fit in for a greenhouse um, for solar power, have recovery. Uh, Evaporation, so um, we can recharge, recharge the aquifer. This is the objective. So um, the work performed is uh, to design the coat and buy materials, build and operate the prototype, and, and the results uh, would be um, the, the the quality of water, the um, uh, the removal of, of solids. 
um, um, and the measure of microorganisms, um, uh, the characteristic characteristics of, of the of the plant, uh, especially the flow rates. So these are examples of, of prototypes of um, solar when we use um, the energy of sun to make um, that the water uh, evaporate and condensate to produce finally water. Like in this example, as a model study, how, how, can, how can we assess with a transfer of energy from the sun by uh, radiation into the air? Here, um, the, the prototype uh, works as a heat chamber that increases the air temperature and humidity, um, allowing water to be extracted. So this is the project, um, an integrate prototype. The prototype consists of a mirror mounted in a plywood box. Two capture solar radiation uh, glass sheets will be used, also a dome, and uh, to accelerate the operation of water, the wall, the, uh, the box will function as a closet system. Um, and the box uh, uh, will be coupled with a metal carbonate structure. Um, so hydraulic settings for the inner and outer flow of the water will be installed and the effluent, effluent capture is expected to have a low uh, total dissolved solids concentration. So the, this is the, the prototype sign. You can see on the, on the left side the, the, um, the cuttings, you know, the, the frontal cuttings, the, um, and the right light, the cuttings. Um, uh, and we are uh, using some materials that we can buy in Chihuahua for uh, uh, target uh, suppliers like Myers. And we, we are, um, uh, we're going to buy a mirror, a plywood, uh, glass, the metal galvanized structure, and use um, the water to produce uh, the, the prototype design. Oh, what's what's next? What's the follow up uh, to to quote and um, um, buy materials first, then to to build the prototype, then obtain uh, water from the reverse almost plant, then uh, pilot testing, and finally samples characterization. So um, in this way. Um, uh, the water is uh, rich in, in salts will become um, maybe potable water in a, uh, and will contribute to the uh, sustainable um, management of water. So once the prototype is designed and built, some laboratory tests will be per performed. Uh, field determination consists of observing microorganisms in treated water via a light microscope. And some of we poured in small glass petri dishes and falco tubes and sent to a laboratory to measure the most probably number of microorganisms. And also in the test, average daily radiation will be a measure uh, of harnessing solar. Um, here um, we have a budget of 10,000 10, US dollars. So um, uh, we are um, dividing the, the budget in um, the desk computer, the micro pipettes, the tablet microscope, the tempered glass, etc. Um, and the box, um, it's related to the items from the prototype for water. So we are um, uh, uh, following, following um, this uh, this project by now. Um, finally, the the samples characterization, characterization includes um, the the water and salts, and may, um, but uh, we want to to measure the um, uh, removal efficiency of total dissolved solids, and, and measure the temperature and electrical conductivity, and and uh, in and the water, and also measure microorganisms and measure um, the quality of water in general with ICT. 
also uh, we are interested in in measure in um, the, the, the 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 salts so we can make a characterization of salts using um, microscope um, scan microscope electron or spectroscopy or x-ray diffraction to know uh, what happened with the salts this is uh, an example of the micro biology, uh, biologic analysis and on the, on the right side you have the, the sample collection in um, plastic bags and then the left side the determination of total anthrac coliform bacteria also the Echerichia coli according to the um, no Mexican regulations and that's it thank you thank you very much now that's interesting work and I absolutely love the fact that he put the diagram up that actually came out of the sand pit and that was uh, <laughs> It was, a, it was a busy couple days, and I love that, that you include that. Thank you. Um, for the final talk, um, we'll go ahead and have uh, Mario. Uh, go ahead up and... Uh... Good afternoon. I'm going to present from here, just for not to forget anything. Well, uh, on May 4th, 1598, Juan, Don Juan de Oñate, Adelantado Captain General and Governor of New Mexico named this region as the Paso del Rio Grande del Norte, or simply Paso del Norte. For uh, the last 424 years, the Paso del Norte has seen the rise of cultural and artistic movements that reflect its unique identity and diversity. Today, it faces serious problems related to violence, drug trafficking, crime, poverty, social unrest, environmental degradation, and immigration. But it continues changing and adapting to the new challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. It is a dynamic and vibrant place that has a rich history and a promising future. Paso del Norte, including the densely populated cities of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, is the largest binational metropolitan area shared between the U.S. and Mexico. The region is suffering the worst drought in, well, somebody say 1,200 years. And that is just one factor contributing to an unprecedented water stress that could leave what is unable to meet basic water needs on the changes that have made. There is an urgent need for transboundary cooperation in water resources management between the two cities. In September 2022, uh, the 50 Liters Home Initiative, led by Greg Holiday, held two workshops in collaboration with the Municipality of Juarez and El Paso Water to recommend improvements needed in water management systems in the area of Juarez and El Paso. During this, these uh, workshops, dozens of priorities were discussed and two overarching themes were set up, education and access to clean and safe water. Five key projects appear, a water observatory in Ciudad Juarez, conservation initiatives within the agricultural sector in El Paso, water access program in Las Colonias in El Paso, an access to drinking water program in Los Kilometros in Juarez, and an urban uh, agriculture initiative in Juarez. Last October, the water observatory's key stakeholders met in Juarez, this time to review the program's progress, discuss goals, and take part in an intensive strategic planning session. According to experts in the region, an observatory is needed to gather and analyze scientific data, laws and regulations, infrastructure issues, and social and economic factors, formulate and prioritize recommendations, and advocate for action. Building on successful examples across Latin America, the US, and Europe, the establishment of an observatory is key to meeting academics business leaders, and key members of civil society to propel action towards a more sustainable world. The Water Observatory in Paso del Norte will be an independent and collaborative institution to serve as a center of learning, innovation, and action in water resilience for the El Paso Juarez metropolitan area. 
the Water Observatory will help thought leaders from different segments of society and with a narrow focus on their fields of expertise come together to develop more holistic approaches and overcome real barriers to coordination. The products of the observatory will help government and utility managers at the city, state, and federal level on both sides of the border to share the same set of data and recommendations. Almost all the water in Ciudad Juarez, whether used to cooling industrial machinery or hydrating school children, comes from the underground Bolson del Hueco uh, that stretches into New Mexico and Texas, including, of course, El Paso. According to researchers, significantly more water is being pumped out of the aquifer that is replenished. And if uh, the current rate of drought continues, the aquifer will be almost empty of fresh water by 2052. Changes in climate, economy, activity, and population have led to an even greater imbalance between supply and demand. In the long term, the situation is unsustainable. And among the many uses that tap into the aquifer, business and residents of Juarez will be the most impacted. This is because the other major population center, say El Paso, has other sources of water, including water from the Rio Grande, that uh, it's managed uh, within upstream in the Elephant Boot Reservoir. And of course, the world's largest inland desalination plant, the Key Valley Hutchinson Desalination Plant, which converts what officials and researchers call an almost unending supply of brackish groundwater into drinking water. The vision of the observatory, it is to work together in initiatives to strengthen water resiliency in the Ciudad Juarez and El Paso metropolitan area. The weather observatory will be an independent, collaborative, innovative, and action-oriented civil organization working towards water resiliency. It will work on the scheme of interdisciplinary think tank with the understanding that water is an essential resource facing present quality and quantity issues. The observatory will develop its activities under the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, uh, sponsorship, the platform Fifty Little Home from Washington, DC, the Cummins Corporation, Yes, they built the crux in the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, which will serve as the official headquarters of the observatory, the mission. Uh, its vision will uh, be to organize constructive discussion that drive the priorities and inform decision about hydraulic resource management to push for more and better public policies related to water, implementation uh, of adaptation measures towards climate change and environmental justice, the, all of them related to the use and conservation of water in the Paso del Norte region. And uh, just let me uh, comment about the objectives. Uh, first, to be a meeting point and a space for dialogue between business leaders, technical professionals, academics, researchers, authorities, students, and civil society organizations to guide the water governance and its sustainable use through consensus and inclusive processes. Number two, to be an incubator for ideas for the most efficient management of available water resources, and to be an instrument for the transfer of knowledge, both to technicians and experts in the sector, as well as the society in general, for the continuous improvement of water uh, management in the region. And uh, just to finish, let me tell you something about the progress to date. Well, today we have uh, integrated a database with the identification and detailed institutional contact information of stakeholders in the water management, supply, and conservation issues in the Paso del Norte region, both sides of the border. A formalization of an MOU between the USJ and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Also, uh, we have developed the proposed functional organization chart for the observatory. Uh, we identify uh, physical space, physical space, office space in the water for the water observatory in the Institute of Engineering and Technology at the USJ. And uh, also, you know, 
we have a estimated budget to finance the operation of the weather observatory during the first year of existence. Uh, it is, uh, we are very excited that uh, the answer has been very positive from the private sector, the, the, the maquiladora sector in Juarez uh, has been very proactive. Uh, and also the academic uh, sector, uh, UTEP included, and we are working with uh, authorities and other other sectors in order to to uh, integrate right now, which is called the board of directors, which will be the body that will regulate the operation of the observatory. Hopefully, if things run well, in two more months uh, we'll be almost ready to start working in real life. Okay, thank you very much. you um so uh we are uh we're actually running a little bit ahead of schedule um which uh, i'd like to open the floor up for uh for questions and answer questions and, and answers um about the technical presentations before we move on to the actual um panel discussion i think we have a few minutes to do that so um any questions out there for any of our uh, speakers This is fun. You get to throw it after you speak. <laughs> there was a there was a discussion about a water desalinization plant to be built potentially uh, on the Sea of Cortez, the north end of the Sea of Cortez, uh, Puerto Penasco. The Puerto Penasco business community was apparently supportive of this. The um, Mexican scholars on the forum shouted water colonialism because <laughs> uh, this is for Phoenix and Phoenix is running out of water but not running out of subdivisions. Do you have any viewpoints on that and whether that's a feasible project or if that's something that you find offensive? I really believe that the future in the whole world of a safe and plenty of water source will be the, the, the ocean, the ocean, the sea. As long as we have uh, more energy available and uh, well, mainly from uh, renewable sources like wind or, or sand, well, the desalination of water, of seawater, is more feasible. And we have good examples around the world, in Israel and other, other parts of the world. So I think that's the future. We need to do a very careful the projects. We need to manage all the aspects of the environmental uh, impacts. But uh, in my opinion, it can be done, it's useful. And, uh, I think will be one of the preferred alternatives in the future. Problems is uh, energy, but as far as we can have uh, more cheap energy, these projects will be more feasible. That's what I think. And also here in El Paso, you have one of the best examples of the desalination. And nothing is well is waste because the the brine is it goes to a different treatment to recover the the minerals like the calcium, the chloride, sulfate. So as my partner said, um, it's the future. But I think the here in Paso City, it's a good example for for many countries and states, especially here in the United States. As, a, as far as I know, uh, many cities in the United States, especially in California, are using the desalination. And we hope in Mexico we can have that technology available soon. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. You've got the solar available soon, right, yeah. for it? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, the design of the prototype, um, solar 
was was made by uh, a student of you of watch who live near uh, uh, a town there where th there are no no more water the dam is um, dying is ending uh, and we, we they need the the water to to irrigate for example the nuts trees or to to uh, consumption so uh, in Chihuahua there is a real need of water and we know that the opportunity is to use solar energy to make a, a water sustainable manage, management and that's the way the, the idea of the prototype to 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 can use uh, the, the, the water the salts um, and um, make a better world. Thank you. I, I, I'll add. I was in. Uh, I was living in Tucson with the Central Arizona Project, oh. and that was another big project that was maybe not as well thought out as it could have been. And I think it combined a little bit with what Juan was talking about. So this is where they piped the Colorado River water all over Arizona in open uh, canals where the solar water does do plenty of evaporating. So I think it is a, it's a major issue. And the question is how to, how to solve it. Desert. Yes, <laughs> exactly. All right, other, other questions about the talks? Any technical questions about talks? Can we throw the, uh, throw the microphone? It's fun. Whoa, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is for Dr. Juan Carlos about your prototype. So assuming your prototype testing goes well and you move on to the stage where you would want to size it up to maybe um, work towards uh, purifying water for, say, like a city or something like that, do you envision there being an upper limit to the amount of water that your prototype would be able to work with before you needed some other source of uh, like purification from like a mechanical means or something like that? Well, in, in, in the first step, the prototype is, is being designed without, without um, mechanical engines. So only we want to use uh, the solar energy, but um, maybe we can uh, use a pump to increase the, the capacity of the, the wetty treatment maybe. But in the first step, we only want to use solar energy to pro to produce um, the water, and to to see if this water can be potable or can be rechar recharged to the aquifer. But um, we are in the first step. Dr. Rocha, I, I, I have a question for you. Uh, you say that uh, you collected 100 or more water samples in the lagoon, and also that you were working with Dr. Lee uh, at the lab, analyzing them. Can you tell us something about your results, preliminary results? Mm -hmm. Do you find a glyphosate in the water of the lagoon? If, if yes, how much? Okay, that's a good question. We just got the results like two weeks ago. And the good news is that we found only one area with uh, uh, levels of glyphosate exceeding the EPA uh, maximum contaminant level, which is 700 ppbs. So only one area. But that's why we uh, we, we took uh, soil and corn samples because we think that the amounts in, in those uh, samples or matrices will be much higher. So maybe in the water they are, is, it is diluted. And also with Dr. Hugo Gutierrez and, and Chuy Hernandez, he is the one take, uh, doing the water characterization using isotopes. That way we can see how old is the water because maybe the, uh, the application of the glyphosate was in May and this is just the amount left. That, and the next sampling is planning for May. So to make sure that the probably the highest levels are, are not going to be in the water.
but we're almost sure that in the corn in the soil we're gonna find something very different and only one sample in one area exceed the level so far everything is between 30 and 200 and 250 ppb so far we're still working in the results i don't want to say that we we are expecting a higher results and that will be good but we're almost sure that yes and i'm 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 an engineer who's a recovering physicist so i like to model things um, so I think that uh, it would be interesting to look at what your expected seasonal variability will be as it goes from water to soil and things like that. I think that'll be some, some really interesting results. Thank you. Actually, in this presentation, I just include the glyphosate, but we are doing many, many uh, parameters. We're measuring many parameters and we are building also uh, maps showing the, the risk and, and trying to identify the area that can represent the harm for humans or for the for the environment. So we are working with uh, anions, cations, uh, ba uh, ba mass uh, balances, the water quality, and also the plan is to find or try to propose alternative for water treated if it's used for um, agricultural purposes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on the uh, on the technical talks? Is there one more? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, Dr. Rocha, are you working on a ban with glyphosate or anything that, that may prevent this? Uh, you mean working with the uh, regulations to ban it? No, unfortunately, no. The intention of this uh, research is provide data to uh, pass it to the stakeholders and maybe they can have more, you know, uh, better decisions in the um, prohibition. Because in Mexico, this pollutant, the glyphosate, is not in the list of the priority pollutants in water. But in the, the the levels that we are using is the one in the EPA, so we're trying to generate all this data to prove that it shouldn't be present in the water, especially because uh, we heard that some people is using that water from for personal use, so they can be exposed to this chemical and others. Yeah, but we're not working with the regulation. We do have an, a question from online. Um, why was the glyphosate uh, selected as the contaminant in this specific area? Well, we have uh, also a publication with the levels of organochlorinated pesticides as DDT and methoxychlor, dieldrin, aldrin, other uh, pollutants that are in the dirty dozen list. So that was the first study that we did because, as I said, they use heavy amounts of agrochemicals. And then the glyphosate is a very controversial topic because in Mexico, sometimes they say that they're going to prohibit it and then it's used. And in the United States, it's, um, it's not banned. So since many products, agricultural products, are, are export, export from Mexico to the U.S., we may be exposed to high levels of this chemical. And this chemical is, is being used because it's cheap, it's uh, easy to use, to spread, and has no color, and has a lot of characteristics that make it feasible for many agriculture. But the thing is that we, we decide to go for it because there are not many uh, studies showing the levels in the water uh, uh, crops. It, it, it is considered an, an emerging pollutant. That's why also it's kind of tough. It's uh, um, measurement in the laboratory, but we consider it very interesting. 
No, no, I think it's great. Uh, you know, I, I, my AOL feed keeps getting things about uh, about if you want to be a part of a lawsuit against uh, Roundup. <laughs> I don't know why they chose my AOL account. Thank you. No, this is for uh, Dr. Vasquez. How would the observatory could help the work that IBWC and CILA do on the, on a daily basis related to water issues here at the border region? Well, as everybody knows, uh, Mexico and the U.S. signed a couple of uh, treaties, as uh, the conference said, one in 1906 and the other one in 1944. Those treaties uh, deal with uh, surface work. And actually, there are no official agreement uh, with the sharing or the using of, uh, of the groundwater aquifer. In the past, several uh, initiatives uh, were done in order to try to coordinate the works, the sharing of information between authorities in El Paso and Juarez, the utilities. But those uh, uh, relationships were more based on personal feelings and personal affinities than in official uh, coordination. But uh, when the people change, many of those relationships were lost. In the observatory, we try to rebuild those kind of relationships. Some, some of those will be formal, but other will be based on, on good faith. And uh, as in the past, and uh, many, many things were shared in the past and things were well, better known in uh, the understanding of what is happening in both sides of the border uh, was shared and were examples of what to do, what is working and what does not work in order not to, to do the same thing. So we envision to sit in the same table, both agencies, and say, well, beyond the official uh, coordination and the official interchange of information, let's work here in Paso del Norte, here where we meet, trying to put together in the table uh, ideas, share programs, information, and examples. And that will be the beginning. And of course, with the participation of the stakeholders and the parties uh, that we're going to invite, uh, I'm sure the ideas will be more uh, brilliant ideas and eventually uh, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, something different, which is right now uh, something like was in the past and hopefully better in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's, uh, the, the, the Water Observatory has got a huge remit, basically. I'd say it's wonderful to start to look at that. So um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll go ahead and bring the, the technical portion to a close, and we'll start the, uh, start the panel discussion here. Um, so first question for our panelists, and uh, whoever raises their hand first gets to answer last. Uh, so uh, how do you perceive the significance of binational collaboration in addressing shared challenges related to water management, quality, and conservation, particularly along the border area? Well, I think that for the binational collaboration, UTEP and WASH are giving a good example that we can work together with different ideas, with uh, a, a researchers, experts in uh, different areas. I think this is multidisciplinary. And the, the projects, for example, this is a short term, but if we think we can make uh, long-term projects. And we also need to look for, for support, not only for the universities. How about government agencies? How about industry? Other uh, people involved, other different actors that, uh, because water is one of the most valuable resources that we have. And we can, we are researchers, but 
we need to include the society, the academia, the government, and by nationally, we have different regulations, but we have the same idea that we need to share the water and we need to work to have better quality. And the main problem could be the scarcity. So since we have that problem, the binational effort should be together. Uh, maybe we're not gonna find the, the solution in one year or in one project, but I think that all this support help us to the, to, with the advance for a benefit for both nations, for, for the binational, I mean, uh, collaboration. I don't know if anyone wants to add something else. Yes, I would like to add something. Uh, if one thing characterizes the border region is the asymmetry uh, between the two parts. Uh, government structures, laws, regulations are quite different in, the, in, the, in, the, in both countries. So the official authorities uh, have some limits, very clear limits. So I think it's time that the academia and the civil society take active role in the coordination and exchanging of information, going beyond the official rules and the limits imposed by the law and the regulations. So I'm very glad to say that UTEP, WATCH, UACJ, and many, many people in Juarez, and I'm sure also in El Paso, will share this idea. Well, um, I think we have the, the same problems, the same needs, all everywhere here in in El Paso or or in Chihuahua, and we have also the persons, the um, experts that can solve the problems. So um, the way to to, to to solve the problems is to to put it on the table and to to try to solve them to solve them and to include students and teachers and the government and the institutions. So excellent, thank you. You know, and and I think you've you've talked around a number of things. You know, there 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 are solutions at different levels. So you talk about technical solutions. We talk about political solutions, policy. Uh, societal solutions and such, right? And and so I think that's that's how we've got to think about water, and it is a scarce resource, particularly in this region, um, you know. But I think if you know, you, you mentioned a couple of those things. We talked about the scarcity a little bit. Um, talked about the asymmetry on the two sides of the border and such, both in in regulation and and, and consumption that that we were talking about a little bit earlier. But uh, you know, from your perspective, um, what are really the most pressing problems uh, and water-related challenges um, across the, in the border region? And how can this collaborative effort between uh, UTEP, Guasahota, and WATCH um, help deal with these and, and find solutions, both at, at more the, the technical level, but then also how can we look to move beyond and into to things like policy and, and, and such? So, but what are, what are those challenges? What are the big challenges that you see? Well, as you know, um, regular regularly or limits or the um, I mean the every actor or every person who represents the government or the institutions of like schools. Are dealing um, with um, uh, try to solve the same problem, the water. So, uh, if you uh, look for uh, what is the solution, I think it's not um, easy solutions. So, um, uh, the thing is. Uh, all, all, all the, all the, all the persons, all the actors must be contribute to to the solution of the problem. The the government, the government knows um, what 
the um, the the quality could be, but um, and the per and, and citizens know that they can they have to pay the water and they need the water, but uh, everyone has their own uh, needs, but the need of of, of the schools is uh, is to solve uh, the problems of the society of the persons and the government must um, uh, make sure that uh, the, the limits are complained. So um, in, this, in, in this situation, um, all uh, we need to, to participate in the, in, in, this, in the problem of water. Well, I think that the first uh, idea that we have to take from this panel is that we are two nations, but it's one water. So we need to find out uh, alternatives where only wh where we can produce results, but those results have to pass to the stakeholders and to the society because um, they need to know what is the current situation because whether or not we need to share the resource of water. So there's a treaty of, of the treaty of 1941 establishes many things. And how can it be possible that we can share the results if the water is scarce in the area? So this is, this is only one of the projects that maybe we are working on. But also, I would like to mention another very important uh, research project that we that we have uh, running uh, too, which is the water reuse. For example, the wastewater treatment plant, the effluent can be reused for other uh, activities, not only for irrigation. For example, the industries can use that that water that way. We can decrease the pumping of the aquifers and Try different trying with different strategies to preserve the water. So uh, if we need to share the water, it's better that uh, both nations do actions to recycle, to reuse, and um, to educate the community, to the society in doing actions to take care of the of the water. For example, uh, children education is very important because they are the future of the tomorrow. So uh, we have uh, we have war with youth uh, also in in the diffusion of the results. When Dr. Wengi Lee went to the chemistry week in Chihuahua, she showed the the problem that we have in both nations. And a good a good thing was the students were more conscient that we need to do more action. So maybe it's a a small seed, but we are pretty sure that the if we still working in this kind of collaboration projects in long term, we can produce more alternatives for taking care of the water. Well, I, I think that one of the most stressing problems we face right now is that uh, many people is aware right now that uh, the water is, uh, uh, something is changing in the water sector. When I was a kid here in Juarez, we used to drink water directly from the hose in the in the yard, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, very few people knew from where the water came, but no concerns. Uh, with the pass of the years, we start listening to the authorities and, and, and other associations that the water is running out, that the uh, quality is changing, and uh, we start to concerning. Right now, I don't know nobody in Juarez that drinks directly the water from the hose or the, from the tap. Uh, everybody right now is on bottled water, which is uh, with quality very expensive. And for certain parts of the of the of the society, it, it's uh, it's an expensive uh, uh, issue. Uh, we can feel that the water is changing because we can feel the 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 flavor of the salt in the water. That's a fact, that's a fact. And right now we are, well, many people is, uh, is aware that things are changing in the bad quality and the 
uh, less water availability just precludes larger or bigger problems in the future. In that, uh, it's really a big concern for, for many people. We, we hear that uh, more industries come into waters and they ask three questions. Do you have land? Yes, we have plenty of land. Do you have energy? Well, we, we can say that, uh, yes, we can provide energy. Do you have water? And the answer is, well, probably, probably yes. Uh, probably, well, uh, hesitating. Uh, there is water, but it's so deep that we cost a lot of money just to bring the water out. And after that, you need, you need also to invest many, many dollars in treating in treat, treating the water in order to, to, to have the right quality. So the answer is yes, but with many buts. And uh, also they ask for people. Do you have people? Well, we can bring people from other parts of the, of the country. And that's another problem. That people will also require water. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I, I want to congratulate everybody here. You know, we we are talking about three universities uh, across two countries uh, interacting and trying to identify and solve these problems. I had the uh, the joy of being in the United Kingdom when we pulled out of the EU with the Brexit vote, and one of the things I watched happen there was a falling apart of regulations and and ability for scientists and for engineers to collaborate. You know, we. The UK was out of out of um, the European Court of Justice, and and it ended up uh, really fracturing and causing a lot of problems on the regulatory side. And so I think it's great that we have this here. I see being stitched back together this relationship. And so I'd ask the panelists, you know, as three universities and as academics, how can we help that stitching? How can we help bring the the, the regulations together and really help society think? I think. Think about water differently, um, which I think is is one of the, the the key points that you've been talking about. So, how how can we as academics uh, assist with this, and particularly across the across the border? Come on, expect to understand your question, <laughs> but um, first we we need to talk that we are persons uh, that um, we have. Um, you know, different cultures, but the same culture, because uh, we have a uh, we, we we were children. We we had the past, like the uh, engineer said, and we uh, probably uh, know that um, we could drink water from the spring. So. In that case, we know that water is uh, a good um, a good thing for us. So the, the the need to to take care of the water, so we can um, share with other professors the same the same situation, the, the same need to 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 share uh, our knowledge and to to produce the. Uh, projects that solve the 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 the, uh, the quality of, of water of the needs of quality water, uh, uh, but I think in in that uh, uh, design of the project is uh, the first the person that is um, uh, conscious of the conservation of water. The, the 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 change of the quality of water and the the need to 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 make a, a sustainable uh, society um, making sustainable resources so um that's why um, we are here like professors um, trying to, to to make um the projects to solve the problems of the society Well, let me tell you something. From the point of view of the water observatory, 
The World Business uh, Council for Sustainable Development is an European uh, organization that uh, congregates more than 200, 200 uh, big firms, industrial firms. Those companies, uh, all of them, uh, have in place water conservation programs and uh, they advocate for the sustainability. The American branch of the World Business Council is the platform of 50L, 50L Home. It's the idea of a home using just 50 liters of water in the future. Well, 50L Home is very active in, in, in the US. Uh, uh, the headquarters is in Washington, D.C. And they work with uh, almost 50 uh, American companies, large companies. One of them is the Cummins Corporation. And uh, by the way, the Cummins Corporation has one of, the, of the, its biggest, largest plants in Juarez. Almost 3,000 people work there. Uh, so uh, they decided to support the initiative of the Water Observatory in this region. But the first thought was, where would be the headquarters, the leadership, and the main stakeholders? And absolutely, they thought on the academia. Why? Because it's prestige, it's continuity, and it's very reliable. And people trust on the, on the universities. Universities uh, have a large acknowledgement of the society. That's the reason we believe in the first, in first uh, by the first sight, in universities as very important stakeholders of the initiative, sharing knowledge, sharing contacts, and in some way uh, guiding uh, most of the decisions based on data and physical evidence which is the work of the scientists at the universities. So, that's it. So, uh, regulations, it's a tough question for me. So, I was thinking that an example could be that in 2022, we were working in the uh, state inventory of water. We measured the arsenic and fluoride sorry, arsenic and fluoride in 1,400 wells in the state of Chihuahua. So that information was um, requested by the water government, Junta Municipal, because they wanted to locate the areas with the highest levels of arsenic and fluoride to implement technologies of removal and provide safe water for the population. So it is clear that water scarcity and quality maybe it's one of the biggest problems that we have here in the border. So regulations later or, or not will force us to reuse the water and to implement technologies to treat it. So I think that for my part, from the technical part, uh, the production of that data helped to uh, locate the risk areas and implement reverse osmosis uh, plans and invest in the technology that really help to the population. So the regulation limit for arsenic and fluoride in that example so are really established. So there's no way that we can move them. But with uh, research studies, uh, we can provide information to straightforward the problem. It's just an example. Great, thank you all for that. Now I've, I've I've hogged the microphone here, so let me uh, let me open it up to uh, to any questions for the panel. Hey, here you get you get to catch the microphone. No, please. Oh, that's a handoff. That's illegal. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I have a question that um, you can intend it a little bit as a provocation, but I think that it's our job in academia to think through things data and ideas. And it's a question that I ask to myself as one of the conference organizers and that I ask other panelists as well. So um, we, we have been talking about, uh, Dr. Burillo mentioned that we all have the same needs. 
and I agree. And I agree that um, on that, but also that uh, different structures and different institutions can address those needs better than others. And, com and certain communities can benefit more than others. Um, I want to invite you to, to uh, think through the notion of binational. Uh, yes, we have one water but I believe that there are more than two nations, uh, even on this border. So my question is, as people working binationally, people working with institutions and agencies, how can we expand the very notion of binational, including even uh, nations whose sovereignty uh, isn't recognized uh, or that is partially recognized? I'm thinking about, of course, the, our indigenous nations, some that have federal recognition, some that don't. Uh, how do you plan to include them in these conversations and rely on their knowledges? I'm thinking in particular the how in California, the knowledge that come from uh, indigenous communities really changed the way they manage wildfires through indigenous knowledge of controlled fires. So how can we, um, really invest energy and care into the knowledges that so far we haven't really included in our conversations. Thank you. Who wants to take first crack? Yes. Uh, for many years, I used to work for the Border Environmental uh, Cooperation Commission. And after that, uh, for the North American Development Bank, those institutions were responsible to manage the Border 2020 and 25 program. It's a program sponsored by the US EPA. It is the official program of environmental cooperation between Mexico and the United States. Long story behind the program. In, uh, in that program, uh, which of course works both sides of the border, includes the tribe and indigenous population as partners. So we can follow a very similar approach in, in all these issues of uh, water management and, and impact. And uh, right now, since two or three years ago, the two main issues, overarching issues across the, board, the, the, the program in Border 2025 is climate change and environmental justice. When we talk about environmental justice, we are talking about the rights of uh, those uh, less, uh, uh, how do you say, politically correctly? Yes. yes. Well, well, <laughs> you understand. So, uh, so we can also follow uh, that approach, which has been very successful in Border 2025. There are the special treatment for the needs of uh, those people uh, who lack of environmental justice. Uh, eventually, a seat in the board of directors of one of those representatives that can bring to the table firsthand the, the needs and proposals. Yeah, that I will say. Um, my, my opinion is that. Um, in, in small in small communities where fluoride and arsenic is the problem with the water, they are expecting that um, I don't know who, but they they are expecting to have a, a better quality of water. They don't care if if it, if it is the government or if it is the university or if it is a particular who is going to solve them the problem. But I think the universities. Uh, can um, help to 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 solve the problem uh, looking for them in the project of the prototype uh, using um, um, nails to eliminate uh, the arsenic from water the next step is to uh, to build up a low cost uh, filter prototype in in a home but um, the professors asked me to 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 implement there 
we are not uh, expecting that, they, that the, the government of the sponsors or anywhere solve the problem because the, the, the people want to, to know um, how can they um, uh, have a better life, have, having a better quality of water. So they, the first is that they, I, they, they are understanding that the quality of water is, uh, is, um, is making um, um, some um, um, problems of, of their health. So there are people in Chihuahua with cancer, for example, and they are, they are, they are understanding that it's because of the water. So the first thing was to look, locate where are the, 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 the wells that has uh, arsenic and fluoride problems, but the next step is to, 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 uh, to reduce the risk of arsenic and fluoride in the water. And so uh, universities can um, make many things in uh, helping that. Yeah. All right, thank you, good question. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Be another handoff. Agriculture uses 75 to 80 percent of the water here in El Paso. I presume it's similar in Mexico. Um, the crops they're growing here are water intensive export crops. Uh, pecans, cotton, 600 gallons of water to make a pound of pecans in the desert. Any thoughts on how? science or academia maybe looking at a long-term strategy might move our agricultural community to less water intensive crops over some horizon of 25 or 50 years or whatever completely true what you say it also uh, there is a high consumption of water to crop alfalfa in order to feed the cattle for dairy, for dairy uh, industry. Many cows, in a, they need a lot of, uh, of food. So pecans and alfalfa are large consumers of water. And of course, it's the same thing in Mexico and Juarez. 60, 40, probably. It, uh, I have talked, I, I have talked about this with some colleagues, and, and they say, well, it's not an easy issue. It needs to be a, a transition between now and the time in the future where we can change crops in, in the region. In the middle, we can work to increase efficiency of the irrigation techniques. Right now, the pecan trees are irrigated by flooding the, the the land it is very inefficient way to do it so probably we need to start uh, trying to convince people to change practices to invest in better irrigation practices as a transition to the point in which we could be ready to change uh, also high value crops but not so water intensive but we will be happy in the future but in the meantime, uh, we have something to do. And also, oh, I think that the uh, agriculture, agricultural producers, they know that there, there's no more water. So the thing is that we have uh, talked to them uh, about the the right uh, way to irrigation and all that, and they are like, uh, we are moving to different crop. One example is that the Mennonites have, uh, have been thinking to change some uh, crops that use so much water, like the corn and pecan, for other crops like uh, cranberries, for example. They said that they are, um, trying to find out if it has a good profit and use less water because even if they want to use it, the wa the water is very scarce. So the the manage the management of the water is something that 
we are not, uh, how can I say, uh, they are asking for help. So we don't have to force them or tell them that there's no water, we need to take care of the water. So now they are, many agricultural have trying to look for solutions and saying, how can we manage the water in a better way? So that's good because instead of the academics or researchers uh, being like, oh, you cannot use so much water, you need to take care of the water, now they, uh, they have a, a more uh, clear scenario that even they want to use it, maybe they have to move to a different uh, crops. It's something very sad, but that's their reality. So, as you said, growing pecans and other crops in the desert is complicated. First step towards solution is recognition of problem, and it sounds like there, there, there's getting to be recognition. So, all right, um, I see our time's about up. So, um, can we thank our panelists uh, one last time?